A digital multimeter is one of the most useful tools that any electronics engineer or hobbyist can have in their toolkit. They can be used for doing all sorts of different electronics measurements like voltage, current, resistance and more. And today I'm going to show you how to use one. My name is Luke and this is Terminal Curiosity. So I recently bought this new multimeter, bought it from EEV Blog to support their channel. By the way, check it out if you haven't already. Dave does some awesome stuff. And I figured I'd do a video on how multimeters work and how to use one for your projects. Feel free to skip ahead to different timestamps if you're looking for an explanation of a specific feature. So when we first take a look at the multimeter, we can see it's got a few different buttons and a dial with a few different modes. So going around the circle, we have voltage with automatic range and a low input impedance. Off, that one's self-explanatory. DC and AC voltage, resistance and continuity, millivolts and temperature, diodes and capacitors, amps and milliamps, and then microamps. There's also a non-contact electric field detector and frequency for whatever voltage or current you're measuring. And if we take off the back door, we'll find the battery cradle and also two fuses here. These are for the current measurements and I'll explain that a bit later. When you get a multimeter, it should always come with a set of probes, obviously one red and one black so that you can actually test things. And in this case, I also got a temperature thermocouple, which I can use to measure temperatures. I'll explain that a bit later. If we take a look at the probes, they have a right angled banana connector on one end and the probe on the other. This is the same for red and black. And if we look closely, we can see that the probe end also has a small collar on it. This effectively makes this a banana as well. So if you need to, you can actually plug it into the banana socket on the multimeter, for example. This is useful if you're trying to connect together two different things that have banana sockets. Maybe you want to measure the voltage output of a power supply using the multimeter. In this case, I can also unscrew this little banana collar and get just the pointy probe, which is useful for probing very small objects or small components on a board. Some other probes are a little bit different in that they might just pull directly off instead of unscrewing. You can also get some different types of multimeter probes. This is not part of the EEV blog kit, but it's something that I had already. And this comes with a few different types of connectors. One that I find particularly useful is this one, which has banana plugs on one end and tiny little mini grabber clips on the other. This is really good for measuring things in circuit or small wires or PCBs. There's also other types of connections, including larger alligators and small, tiny, sharp probes. First up, I'll show you how to measure voltage. In this case, I've already turned it to the voltage mode. Now we need to plug our probes in. When we're measuring voltage with these, we need to plug it into the voltage port and the common port. And here I have a typical nine volt battery. If I simply put the red lead to the positive and the black lead to the negative, we get 9.5 volts on the multimeter. And if we look closely at the screen, we can see this straight line with three dashes underneath it. This means we're measuring DC voltage. If we were to measure an AC voltage, a changing signal, that would look like a little squiggle. When you're measuring DC voltage, it's worth noting that if you connect the probes one way in the circuit, you'll get a positive number. But if you change the probes over and put them in the opposite places, you'll get the same number but negative. Another thing to note is that if you take the two probes on voltage mode and you touch them together, you should always get zero volts measured on the screen. This tells you that you have a difference in voltage of zero between the two probes, which makes sense because you've shorted them out. Here's another example. Let's say you're working on a PCB and you're testing it because something's not quite right. You want to measure some voltages on the PCB and check if everything is okay. So in this case, I'm going to use the little clippy connectors and attach them to strategic parts of the board and see what the voltages are. Apparently I forgot to include a ground test point on this PCB design, so I'm going to use the shield of the USB instead. For example, here I'm testing one probe point and it's giving me 3.3 volts, which is what I expect. So that means this part is working fine. You can also test this kind of thing using your sharp probes as well, but just make sure that you're very careful to avoid shorting out any adjacent components that might damage the board. Now, just a word of warning, if you're working on a circuit that has higher voltages, it's much safer to apply your multimeter clips while the circuit is turned off and then step back and turn on the circuit remotely and observe the number. This saves you probing around in high voltage zones and risking electrocuting yourself or breaking something else in the circuit. Here's a little sneak peek of my next project, which is hopefully my next video. This is a Nixie tube project, and these need 170 volts to turn on, which is hazardous. As you can see, I've connected the multimeter leads separately while the circuit is turned off, 
and now I'm going to turn it on from a safe distance while watching the voltage without getting my fingers anywhere near it. And if you're not already subscribed, consider hitting that subscribe button so that you get notified as soon as I post a new video. It's also important to be aware of the voltage rating of your multimeter probes. In this case, these ones are rated to 1kV, which is definitely in spicy voltage territory. This just means that if you're using these on 1kV, that's their maximum rated voltage. If, if you exceed that, it may damage the probes. So if you want to play around with high voltage, maybe just don't, unless you know exactly what you're doing. Up until now, we've been measuring stable DC voltages, and we can see on the multimeter screen that there is a horizontal line with a couple of dashes beneath it. That means that you're measuring DC. But what happens if we try to measure something that's changing? Here's my signal generator that I built in a previous video. If I measure the output like this, now you can see the multimeter goes a bit crazy. It, it's not sure what to do here because this is a changing voltage and it expects it to be stable. So if I press the select button, this little symbol that shows that it's DC voltage changes to a squiggle and that shows us that we're now measuring a changing voltage. If I try again, it gives us about four volts. And that's exactly what we would expect from this device. Now let's look at measuring current in the circuit. This is different to voltage in that we need to use a different port. So firstly, we'll keep the common port the same, but now we put the red connector in either the amp port or the milliamp microamp port. Both of these will work for measuring current, but they're designed for different current values. So if you're working with higher current, use the amp port, but if you're working with lower current, use the milliamp or microamp port. The difference is the two fuses that I pointed out earlier, which are based in the back of the multimeter. When you're measuring current using a multimeter, the current itself flows through a low resistance resistor inside the multimeter, which means that if your current is too high, it can break something. That's why those fuses are there to protect it, so they'll break first. And the two different ratings allow for two different magnitudes of current to be measured safely. So if you put a high current measurement into the milliamp port, you'll probably pop the fuse. But if you put a low current into the amp port, that's okay, but you just won't get a very precise measurement. So I'm going to use the milliamp socket and then turn the dial until it reaches the milliamp range. Now we need to connect up the probes somehow. When you're performing a current measurement using a multimeter, you need to put the multimeter in series with the circuit you're measuring, not parallel like with voltages. This means that you actually need to break the circuit and place the multimeter in line with the circuit. So to do that, I'm going to turn off the LED and rearrange the circuit so that there is some room to connect my tiny probes here and measure the current in the circuit using the multimeter. For this experiment, this is a bit clumsy because as you can see, the probes are quite long now and they're tipping over a bit, but that's okay. I'll just hold them up for now so that we can still do some measurements. And if I turn the power back on, it says that we're measuring 0.35 milliamps, which is quite small. We could actually measure this using the microamp range in this case. So if I turn that to the microamp dial, yep, now we see 351 microamps going through this LED circuit. When you're finished measuring current, it's always a good idea to remove the probes from the multimeter and maybe even put them back into the voltage ports. This is because when you're measuring current, it passes that current through the multimeter itself through a very low resistance. And if you keep it in current mode and then apply a voltage, you might push way too much current through the multimeter and pop the fuse. Some multimeters are actually smart enough that they'll give you an alert if you change it into the wrong mode while you've still got it connected to the current probe ports, like this one. It makes an annoying beepy noise to let you know that you've made a mistake. And in fact, it won't even let you try to measure voltage while you've got it plugged into the current ports. That's a nice safe design. Now let's say we want to measure the resistance of something. We can change the dial to the resistor mode and my multimeter defaults to this Wi-Fi looking symbol here, which is not actually Wi-Fi, but I'll explain that in just a moment. I'm going to press the select button and then that switches it over to resistance mode. So if I touch these two probes together, we get 0 0.3 ohms, which is very low and that's exactly what we'd expect. Now if I place the probes around these resistors in this circuit, I measure 6.8 kilo ohms, which sounds about right. Now, if we press the select button and go back to this Wi-Fi looking mode, that's not actually Wi-Fi, unfortunately. In this case, it just means noise, and it's going to test the continuity of the circuit. So now, if we tap together the two different probes, we'll get a continuous circuit and the multimeter will beep, and also the screen will flash, apparently. 
This is really good for measuring things like short circuits between components that you wouldn't expect, or measuring the ends of cables to find out which pin goes to which other pin. It's also really good for checking that components are earthed properly. So you would test the continuity between one component and, for example, your ground plane or your chassis. Next, let's take a look at the temperature mode. So for this, we need to remove our probes and put them carefully somewhere else, like on the floor. And then we grab our temperature thermocouple. If you have a slightly cheaper multimeter, you might not have this feature. This is more of a special feature than a, a standard one. And the thermocouple, in this case, will basically measure the temperature of whatever's on the end of the wire. And this goes between common and the voltage port. We can see there's a, a temperature thermometer type indicator on the voltage port. So if I plug this in, it's going to complain because we've still got it in resistance mode. So if I change this to temperature mode, which happens to be the little thermometer, and then press select so that we activate that and plug it in and we can let it stabilize. And it's about 23.5 degrees in this room right now. If I hold this with my hand, immediately it warms up until it warms up with the temperature of my hand. Now you might be interested in tracking something like the longer term trends of values that you're measuring. And what we can actually do here is on this multimeter and many others, you have a record button. I'm going to press this and it lets me measure, for example, the maximum. So the maximum temperature it is measured now is 26. But if I hold onto it and it warms up, then I let go and it cools back down. It's not going to update this because it's showing me the maximum temperature that we made. You can cycle through these to measure maximum, minimum, and even average, depending on the kind of multimeter that you have. This feature works with all sorts of measurements, by the way. It, it works with voltage, current, even resistance. It's not exclusively to temperature, so you can use that for all sorts of testing. Another feature that your multimeter might have is the ability to measure components like capacitors and diodes. Mine has this ability, and I'm going to show it. So we just turn the dial until we reach the component mode. And this has started up in diode mode. Here I have a basic generic 1N4001 diode, and I'm going to connect it to my multimeter. So this is telling me 0.5 volts, which is the forward bias voltage required to turn on this diode. This also works for LEDs because, well, believe it or not, they're diodes too. This actually turns on at 2.5 volts and starts powering the LED. Now what happens if I reverse this? And here you can see if we put the connectors on the wrong way around, nothing happens. It doesn't break the LED, it doesn't do anything. This is a good way to show whether you've got the diode connected the right way or not. Now let's try a capacitor. So we've switched it to our components mode and we click select to go to capacitance. In this case, it's automatically ranged in the nanofarad range, but it, because it's automatic, we don't have to worry about changing that. Here I have an electrolytic capacitor and this is 100 microfarads. Now, before we plug it into the multimeter, we should always make sure that it's discharged first. If you have any residual charge left on your capacitor and you plug it in, you could get strange readings or possibly even damage the multimeter. In this case, this part just came out of my spare parts box, so it's pretty unlikely it's got any charge on it, but I'll just short it on this screwdriver anyway, just for good practice. If you're working with capacitors that may have high voltage on them still, then uh, don't use a screwdriver. Use a resistor or something to discharge it safely and slowly. On this multimeter, we even have a low impedance discharge mode, which is specifically for discharging capacitors like this. Although not all multimeters will have that. Dave actually made a video about this on his channel, explaining how this works and how to do this safely. I'll link to it in the description. Now we can plug it into the multimeter. It takes a while to stabilize because it needs some time to actually charge up the capacitor and then read the value it's charged up to. But what we see here is that this 100 microfarad is actually 115. Look at that, bonus. Here's another example using a small capacitor bank. This has three 960 microfarad caps in parallel. So we should see the total at around three millifarads, maybe a bit less. As we can see, this one takes quite a while to charge up. And we get 2.5 millifarads total. So it's a bit less than the expected total, but these caps might just be a bit old. So there's a basic tutorial of all the simple things you can do with the standard digital multimeter like this one. Your device might be different. You might have more features or less features. Some of them are more advanced and more technical. Some of them are more simple, but this should get you started. If you like this video, hit that like button. And if you want to keep up to date with other things I'm working on, interesting projects and other tutorials, consider subscribing. Cheers.